the Arab world is not clearly moving towards a democracy at this time. I'm not going to make long-term prognosis for what uh, might happen, but certainly we are not in a period of reform, we are not a period of great political dynamics, and right now, if anything, it's a period of consolidation of existing regimes. One of the most striking uh, aspects of the situation that exists in Arab countries right now is the situation of stagnation. Uh, a few years back, in the early part of this de decade, even towards the middle of this decade, there was a sense that uh, the Arab world was entering a period of transition that was a ferment. Not really that change uh, uh, was clearly on the way, but that it was unlikely that things would stay as they were. Populations were mobilized, there were a lot of groups. There was a real hope for change. And if you look at the situation now, what is most uh, uh, striking is really the sense that the Middle East is stagnating politically. Uh, it's, uh, perhaps it's making a little progress economically, but from the point of view of, uh, of the political scene, what we see is governments regaining whatever little political space they had allowed to the population. There is, in country after country, it's very striking. If you look at uh, the governments in power, if you look at the personalities in power, they are pretty much the same that were there uh, uh, that were there 10 years ago. And if they are not the ones who were there 10 years ago, they are their children, they are part of the same uh, dynasties, some of them Republican dynasties, if I, can call, uh, if I can call them, as in the case of Syria and so on. So that the, uh, the main, uh, I think if there is one word that, that describes to me the situation of the Arab world, the political situation in the Arab world now is stagnation. As we highlight in, in the book, we have uh, different um, types. Uh, when you look at Arab countries and how far, how close they are to meaningful democratic reforms. We have a first type which um, uh, we basically um, focus on Morocco, on uh, to an extent a country like uh, Yemen, to a lesser extent a country like Algeria, where we have um, governments, ruling establishments um, that have accepted um, since two decades or more in Morocco, a bit less in Algeria, more or less since one decade in Yemen, that have accepted regular participation by opposition movements and opposition political parties in parliamentary politics as well as sometimes even sharing um, uh, power with them in a, in a, as junior partners in ruling coalitions, in government coalitions. Algeria has two uh, opposition parties which are represented, represented in a government coalition. Yemen did have a coalition between the currently ruling um, uh, Congress party of President Ali Abdullah Saleh and um, uh, Islah uh, Union, which is becoming now an opposition party. So we have a, a first type where Morocco, Algeria, Yemen can be classified and where we have at least some um, um, uh, stability in terms of how governments share to, uh, as, with opposition parties as junior partners, at, uh, part of, of political power. We have a second pattern which is basically um, related to Egypt and Jordan, where we have governments and opposition movements primarily moving from moments, brief moments of uh, relaxation to long phases of escalation and um, ongoing confrontations and clashes. If you look at Egypt between 2003, 4 and 5, there, were, there was some democratic dynamism. The government was signaling its willingness to share, at least in parliamentary politics. Part of what used to control was opposition movements. We ended up having 20% opposition re representation in the Egyptian People's Assembly. Right after it, the government shifted and changed its uh, mode of um, uh, interaction with the opposition parties and started a long and ongoing process of backsliding on what happened between 2004 and 2003 and 2005 and on repressing opposition movements, primarily the Muslim Brotherhood. And the same goes for Jordan. You compare Jordan, end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, with Jordan in the last few years. In fact, it's a country which is not progressing towards democratic reform. It's definitely backsliding from a previous uh, pluralist momentum which existed at the beginning of the 1990s. 
and 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 so as, so we have a second type where um, a brief moment of brief moments of relaxation are followed by long phases of confrontation between governments and opposition movements. A final type, basically, where we um, uh, group countries like Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Libya and even Gulf countries like uh, Qatar and the UAE, where we basically do not have in any meaningful sense an organized pluralist political space. We have an organized pluralist political space in Morocco. We have legal political parties in, in, in Egypt. We have parties in, in Jordan. We have uh, legalized uh, parties in, in Yemen and in Algeria. But in the, in, in the four countries I refer to, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Libya, and uh, UAE and Qatar, five countries, we do not have uh, organized opposition movements. They do not exist. And, 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 and here we basically are looking at polities which are structured um, around a uh, royal family or a uh, republican ruling dynasty, as we, as we highlight in the book, or basically around the leader, as it is the case in Libya, uh, Muammar al-Khazafi. And here we totally lack any dynamism related to the democratic reform. And when these countries speak about reforms, when they fashion an official rhetoric on reforms, they um, often mean administrative reform and reforms which by no means um, uh, come close to opening up um, their existing um, uh, polities or sharing um, uh, some space with opposition movements that get um, uh, a legal existence that's not part of, of, of the game which is going on in, in, in these countries. So we have these three types and we highlight in the book the differences between them and come to the conclusion that with all significant differences between them in general when we, when we take a regional look at what has been happening in, in the Arab world in the last um, uh, five to six years, the region is stagnating. Um, Morocco uh, is as it was uh, since mid-1990s. Uh, we did not have any significant leap toward more democratization or pluralism. Egypt and Jordan are backsliding, and the last group is unchanged uh, in an unchanged way, remains autocratic and authoritarian. One of the problems in uh, uh, promoting democracy or in uh, Arab countries, also one of the problems for Arab countries in making progress towards, uh, towards uh, democracy is there is an imbalance of forces between the government and the opposition. Government, the regimes in power in the Arab world have a lot of control. They have control over the security forces. They have very much control over the electoral process, are very good at manipulating the situation so that essentially they have a lot of tools at their disposal, including state finances to be used for partisan, uh, for partisan purposes. Opposition groups have very few tools at their disposal. Essentially, opposition parties have to rely mostly on the support of the population, on building up the support of the population. That is what also brings them their financing. And they find it very difficult to do it. They find it very difficult to do because of the weakness of their message. They find it very difficult to do because of the, uh, 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 the steps that governments take to prevent them from building that support. They cannot hold meetings. They cannot hold public meetings, for example. It's very difficult, difficult for them to finance their activity. Let me give you an, uh, an, uh, an example. The uh, Egyptian government, for example, has undertaken a systematic campaign to arrest uh, uh, businessmen who are close to the Muslim Brotherhood and have been providing funding. So that essentially anybody who tries to support uh, the uh, political organization opens themselves to, uh, to repression to, in the most extreme cases, to the possibility of arrest. And as long as there is such a tremendous imbalance of power between the government and the opposition, it is impossible for the opposition to bring about a real change because you cannot have a more democratic country without a redistribution of political power. Progress towards democracy requires a redistribution of political power so that the power of the incumbent regime is not so overwhelming. And at this point, the, because of the reasons that I have uh, just outlined, the opposition does not have the capacity to bring about the switch in the balance of power in these countries. Understanding regime opposition dynamics in, in, uh, in the Arab world is key to, to analyze um, why, why the region in general 
um, has not been prog progressing towards democracy. We have, um, uh, apart from a few cases where we have weak states, where we have weak central governments, like in Yemen, for example, uh, where, where the state um, is disintegrating uh, in different ways, or a place like Lebanon, where be because we have um, uh, a pluralist social fabric and a weak state, the state and state institutions not really have the real say in terms of what's going on inside Lebanon uh, politically. Apart from these two examples, um, uh, the Arab world is managed, controlled, ruled by strong governments. And, and these strong governments sometimes have um, uh, ruling parties uh, behind them, sometimes not. But in, 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 in all cases, they, um, they have strong instruments, which they have been using systematic and, and, in fact, have been excelling over time in using them to control their societies and to rule them, um, sometimes with a portion of democratic uh, representation, sometimes with a portion of political pluralism, sometimes with a space for free expression of uh, opinion and, and a free, uh, free media space, sometimes with some civil society organizations which exist, and sometimes not. And these instruments are, um, um, as we highlight in the book and as Marina suggested, one, the fact that these governments control mighty uh, security, um, uh, in each case, a mighty security apparatus, um, uh, which in fact has improved over time. And, and the time I'm referring to is since the establishment of the modern Arab state, basically after the Second World War. They have improved over time in terms of controlling and monitoring and surveilling society. In many cases, um, uh, Arab security services are by far the most well-organized um, uh, state institution. You compare them to foreign ministry, for example to uh, the state bureaucracy in general. And you see um, um, a big significant difference between security services on the one side and um, uh, other government institutions on the other side. In fact, security services have been eating away from, uh, from the roles which were assigned previously assigned to foreign ministries, for example. If you look at Egypt or Jordan, much of what we can refer to as Egyptian or Jordanian foreign policy is managed by the Jordanian and the Egyptian security apparatus and no longer by the foreign ministry. So we have mighty security services on the one hand. We have, secondly, um, uh, once again, as we highlight in the book, governments in, in, in the first two patterns I was referring to, Morocco and Egypt, um, um, governments that have learned over time to manipulate uh, electoral uh, processes, uh, starting from um, electoral laws, um, uh, districting, um, how they manage uh, when, when, when they let in international or regional or local uh, monitors, how they manage them, how they create an impression of truly uh, democratic, truly pluralist elections, uh, which, however, lack in many, in, in many ways real democratic substance. A third instrument which they have is the fact that governments have developed over time um, um, using um, its, its, its control over the allocation of resources, patronage systems which grant governments and the ruling parties a granted constituency in any election. I mean, many Egyptians, if they go to election um, uh, freely, they do not vote for the ruling party. But many of them, the majority of them, in fact, does not go to uh, polling centers freely. They are forced to go by government institutions, by the public sector institutions they work for. So we have, and the same goes for Morocco, the same goes for Algeria and Yemen. So we have strong patronage systems in place which secure and, and provide governments and ruling parties with granted constituencies. Um, uh, an additional factor which we highlight in the book where we discuss liberal leftists as well as Islamist parties is definitely the weakness of opposition parties. And, and it's, it's a weakness in terms of constituency building strategies. It's an organizational weakness in terms of fashioning strong, dynamic uh, party organizations or party-like organizations where parties are not uh, legal in Arab countries, Kuwait, uh, for example. And, and, and the weakness of the opposition in terms of its ideological commitment to democratic procedures. Now, I'm not talking about democratic ideals. I mean, there we st are still having big debates in the Arab world about democratic norms and whether they fit, whether they are compatible to religion or not. I'm talking about procedures where they have come finally to agree on elections, um, 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 
checks and balances between branches uh, of government. So uh, the commitment of, of, of Arab liberal leftist and Islamist opposition parties to democratic proce procedures has come fairly late. Um, in fact, it's only in the last two to, to four years that there are signs of an increasing uh, commitment to these procedures and, and, and the vision by these parties sometimes, in fact, not very clear, but at least a sort of a strategic commitment to them as the only way to move ahead. But this has been lacking or was lacking for a long time. And in fact, it, 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 it did cost opposition parties in terms of their popular credibility. It did cost them in terms of um, whether they can uh, secure uh, support by Western governments or Western civil societies which have been interested in, in democracy issues in the Arab world. Many Arab countries have introduced political reforms in the course of the last decade. Uh, in, uh, for example, what uh, many countries in the Gulf that did not use to hold elections regularly are now holding regular elections and so forth. None of this really has changed dramatically the political dynamics of the country because uh, these political reforms uh, are very limited. They were carefully designed, the constitutional changes, for example, were carefully designed to make sure that uh, the opposition could not win election, that would not take over. So that, in a sense, except perhaps for the first elections that were held after, in some countries after the uh, uh, after reforms were introduced, governments have learned how to <clears throat> to control very carefully the impact of the reform. Opposition parties have not been very effective for <clears throat> a number of reasons. Some of them are really not uh, their own faults, uh, that is that they have very little political space in which uh, to operate. Arab governments really try to control <clears throat> the amount of leeway that opposition groups have in trying to organize. For example, in Egypt, you cannot, ha you cannot hold public meetings. A party cannot organize a rally. But it cannot even, <clears throat> not only in the streets, but it cannot do in a theater with, you know, with a large number of people and so on. So, of course, that makes it very difficult for groups to organize. But also, parties have been, uh, uh, to some extent, have compounded the problem. The opposition party have compounded the problem, particularly the secular parties, the liberal parties and the leftist parties, by not having a clear message, uh, by not having a message that appeals to a larger segment of the population. In many countries outside the Gulf, particularly, the population, the bulk of the population is rather poor. Just talking about the need for constitutional amendments is not an argument that, that holds much water. The Islamist parties that have a much easier access to people through the mosques, or through charitable organizations and so on, also have failed to convince a large number of people that they would not impose uh, a strict, strict Islamic rule. So that there is a lot of skepticism, particularly in the middle class. Islamic parties are more supported than the liberal and leftist parties. There is no doubt about that. But there is also a lot of skepticism. And you see that in the fact that, that most Arabs don't bother to vote. The turnout at election is very, vo uh, very low, which means that no opposition party is really capturing the sympathy of the population. Of course, it also means that governments are not capturing the support of the population. Point is that nobody is capturing the support of the population. I think the hope that tends to be put in civil society organization is uh, grossly exaggerated, very frankly. Uh, civil society organizations are important. They are an important part of a well-functioning democratic political system, but we cannot expect uh, civil society organizations, which tend to be small, <coughs> that don't have access to many resources, <coughs> that are not free to operate, to really fill in the vacuum which is left by the weakness of political parties. So I don't think we can hope for salvation to come from civil society organizations. 
I think it's extremely difficult for the West to promote democracy in the region at this point for two reasons. <clears throat> the first one is that democracy promotion really has acquired a bad name because of what the Bush administration did. Under the Bush administration, there was a lot of confusion between democracy promotion and the regime overthrow. So that now there is a lot of suspicion in the Arab world about what does the West really mean when, they talk, when somebody talks about a democracy promotion. And secondly, democracy promotion, it's, you know, there are real technical problems. There are real questions about how do you promote a democracy? What can the West usefully do to change the situation that exists in Arab countries? And particularly given the great weakness of the opposition parties, I think it's very difficult for the West to intervene in a way that really helps change the political dynamics in the countries. I think what the West can learn from recent experiences about the democracy promotion is that the, you cannot work in a vacuum, that you really have to work with existing political forces to find a way to build on what there is in the country, that you cannot just come into a situation and decide that the country has to move towards democracy without taking stock of what, what is the balance of power in the country, what is the balance of power between the government and the opposition, what are the groups with which the West could work in trying to bring about a change in those countries.